please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. A recent survey by Pew suggests that you don't just have a room full of fans, you have a nation of fans in India. The Pew survey says that my countrymen, 74% of them had enormous confidence in you when you were president, 77% thought of America as a positive country. And for what it may count, those percentages under your successor are just 40 and 56. So what is a country where most people think of you as a superstar? Well, I, first of all, I think uh, it's important to transmit this information to my daughters. <laughs> uh, because those of you who are parents, I'm sure you've noticed uh, that you are never uh, a prophet in your own land. Um, you know, they, I, I sit around the dinner table and they make fun of me and they think I'm silly. So I, I'm going to let them know of this information that there are hundreds of millions, even billions of people who think I know what I'm talking about. Um, but, but uh, well, I, I, I do think that part of, of the, the, the strength of, of the U.S.-India relationship uh, and, and I benefited from that in terms of the work I did here. Uh, it has to do with the extraordinary people-to-people -people ties that exist. Um, it, it, there, there is a, a set of values, as I mentioned earlier, that we share uh, that's based on family and friends. Last night I went to dinner uh, and there was some doll and people were trying to explain to me doll. I explained to the waiter that I didn't need to know what doll was because I had had an Indian roommate and a Pakistani roommate whose mothers had taught me how to cook doll. So I'm pretty sure I'm the first U.S. president <laughs> to have a doll recipe, which is excellent. Um, my kima is also excellent. My chicken's okay. But, but, but I use that as an example. Th those kinds of connections, I think, um, extend beyond any policy that a government may make uh, or uh, the back and forth that exists uh, in terms of uh, y y you know, the, the, the ebbs and flows of, of the national governments. And, and I think that that exists between India and the United States uh, at a level that uh, is extraordinary and continues to grow. Uh, and I'm, I'm very uh, happy about that because, as I said before, you, you have to have democracies uh, of our size and prominence function uh, effectively in concert in order to promote the values we care about internationally. President Obama, we know you as a great president. Who would have thought you are a great cook as uh, well? Can you, can you manage a chapati? No, chapati is too hard. <laughs> you know, you have to get it just right and flaky, and it's, it's difficult. Let me start with the last thing you did on the last day of your last trip. The town hall on the 27th of January 2015, and you said, and I'm going to quote you, every person has the right to practice their faith as they choose. Nowhere is that more important than in India. India will succeed so long, so long as it's not splintered along lines of religious faith. Diversity is our strength, and we have to guard against any effort to divide us along sectarian lines. And as you said those words, not just me, but hundreds of journalists felt this is a message to the Indian government, to Mr. Modi perhaps in particular. Was it? No, I, I think it was a message to all of us. Um, I, I have said the same thing in private to Prime Minister Modi, but uh, I've said the same thing in public in the United States of America. I've said the same thing in Europe. Uh, you know, if, if you look at what is happening on the international stage, uh, as I mentioned before, partly because people feel worried and insecure about all the changes that are taking place, some of which are economic, but some of which are cultural and social. Uh, there are demographic changes that are taking place, migration, uh, 
people start looking different. There's a collision of cultures. People see uh, much more vividly the differences between people. Sometimes they miss the commonalities between people just through the internet. And there is something in us humans that like making distinctions to make ourselves feel more important than the other person. Uh, and sometimes those are based on race, and sometimes those are based on uh, religion. Sometimes they're based on class. They're always based on gender, and that's one of the things we need to focus on, is making sure that, uh, because that, that, that's universal uh, within all camps. And if, if, you, if you examine the course of human progress, where we have progressed is where we have reduced and, and, if not eliminated, the barriers of these artificial distinctions. So that the reason you can have an outstanding business person who didn't simply inherit everything but built it themselves is because you have different rules now than in feudal times about who could aspire to enter into an enterprise. The reason that I'm sitting here is because somebody worked hard to reduce the barriers that said somebody who looked like me could not aspire to a certain office of leadership. And there's a counter narrative taking place at all times, but I think it's particularly pronounced now. You're seeing it in Europe. You're seeing it in the United States, and sometimes you see it in India, where uh, those old tribal impulses reassert themselves. Um, and there are leaders who, uh, I think, uh, try to push back against those impulses, and then there are those who try to exploit them. And I want to make sure that we are encouraging as much as possible those voices that remind us that we work well together when we recognize our common humanity. And it, it, particularly in a country like India, uh, where you have such an enormous Muslim population that is successful, integrated, and thinks of itself as Indian, uh, and that is un unfortunately not always the case in some other countries where a religious minority nevertheless feels a part of, I think that is something that should be cherished and nurtured and cultivated. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I think uh, all uh, far-sighted uh, Indian leadership recognize that, but it's important uh, to continually reinforce it. President Obama, you began your answer very interestingly, and I want to pick up on it. You said this message that everyone has the right to practice the faith of their choice, and nowhere is it more important than India, is a message you've given not just publicly to the world, but privately to Mr. Modi. And I want to ask you, what was his response? How did he take the message? And I'll pause a moment and tell you why I asked, so you can answer both halves of the question together. You're aware that the Western press increasingly in the last three years, particularly since your speech in 2015, have been portraying India as a country where intolerance is growing. They talk about beef bans, they talk about cow vigilante lynchings, they talk about love jihads. So when you gave this message in private to the Prime Minister, there are many here who'd be keen to know what was his response? Well, I, you know, he's a very good journalist. I think it's fair to say that I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, my goal here is not to disclose uh, every private conversation that I have uh, uh, with, with other, uh, other leaders, but uh, I think his impulses are to recognize the, the importance of Indian unity. Uh, I know that he firmly believes in the need for that in order to advance uh, to the great nation status that India uh, possesses and will continue, uh, I think, to amplify in years to come. But as I said before, I, th I think it's very important to understand this is the work of all of us. Yeah. 
Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I say in my farewell address in the United States is that the most important office in a democracy is not the office of president or prime minister or governor or mayor. Uh, it's the office of citizen. Because by definition, each of us have a responsibility in order to make, uh, make our democracy work. And I, I think that obviously those of us like myself when I was president, even post-presidency, Prime Minister Modi, others, our voices have more reach and we have an obligation to deliver these messages. Uh, but it's the task of all of us uh, to reinforce it. Be One thing I will say about politicians as a general rule, this is not directed at any, because I know there's some in the audience uh, who are, I'm sure, outstanding public servants. Uh, so this is directed at me, it's directed at every elected official. Uh, rarely do elected officials get out too far ahead of public opinion. And so if you see a politician doing things that are questionable, one of the things, if you're a citizen, is to ask yourself, uh, am I encouraging or supporting or giving license to the values that I'm hearing out of the politician? Because, frankly, politicians tend to be more of a mirror and more of a reflection of forces in the society Every once in a while, they get out ahead uh, uh, and, and actually lead, but oftentimes they're reflecting. And so if, if communities across India are saying, we're not going to fall prey to division, then uh, that will strengthen the hand of those politicians who feel the same way. Now, President Obama. <laughs> President Obama, when you came for that visit when you were the chief guest at Republic Day in 2015, you solved the problem of the nuclear liability issues that had been rankling for a while, and you called it a breakthrough understanding. To be honest, and you're aware of this, neither the American press nor the Indian press were quite as enthusiastic as you were. Almost three years have passed, and no meaningful step has been taken by either Westinghouse or GE to build a nuclear plant in India. So looking back, are you disappointed by the fact that the nuclear deal and solving the liability issue hasn't led to more productive results, particularly for American companies? Well, uh, you know, there's always a little bit of a mercantilist element to the job of leading a country. You know, you're, you want to see your businesses doing well and engaged uh, in other countries, and obviously the, the trade and uh, cross-investment that takes place between the U.S. and India is extraordinarily important. Uh, my goal with respect to uh, the nuclear issue was just to give uh, Westinghouse uh, and GE and other U.S. companies a, a chance, an opportunity. My job was not to uh, guarantee that a deal goes through. Um, that's a little bit below my pay grade um, at the time. Um, so uh, uh, I, I do think, in general, uh, just, just to step back more broadly and, and look at uh, the nuclear issue, uh, I think the goal, from my perspective when I was president, was to assure that India, which had uh, a uh, significant uh, nuclear infrastructure and uh, you know, remarkable scientists and needs for energy, et cetera, uh, that we recognized reality. We put the nuclear issue on a stable footing so that it wasn't an impediment to strong bilateral relations, uh, that we encouraged the kinds of uh, safeguards and measures uh, and international standards that all of us need to abide by. As you know, this was one of my priorities in the nuclear security summits that I hosted during the, my presidency, so that we wouldn't have nuclear materials falling into the hands of terrorists or non-state actors, that we were observing best practices in terms of how materials were handled and so forth. And on, on a wide range of those fronts, we made significant progress. 
uh, particular contracts have not been signed and so forth uh, is not something that I, but let, let me put it this way, of the things that I lose sleep about during my presidency, that, that hasn't been one of them. On the nuclear issue, there was enormous promise when you were president that India's application to join the nuclear supplies group would come through. Mm. It hasn't. Mm. And China now is visibly and repeatedly blackballing India. How do you view this problem? And do you think China's attitude is justified? Or do you think it's unwarranted? Well, this is a sophisticated group. Uh, uh, but I don't know if we want to get too deep in the weeds on the nuclear supply group. Uh, but the, the, the basic notion is um, whether India can be part of an organization of countries that have nuclear power and abide by a certain set of uh, norms and safeguards, but are also then uh, recognized internationally in order to be able to operate uh, in this area. Uh, we worked very hard to try to get India into the nuclear supply group. It is true that the organization's charter is structured so that uh, it requires unanimous consent of the members for a new member to join. And there were some who were concerned that India was short-circuiting some of the previous procedures that others had had to follow. Uh, our argument was they are now meeting the standards that we abide by, so let's go ahead and just recognize that fact. Um, we did not get the cooperation of every country. Um, what we tried to then suggest was maybe there are some inter interim steps, an interim membership that might be available. Um, we were not be able, I was not able to get that completed before I left uh, because of resistance from some of the other countries. Uh, but I think, I'm, I'm sure Prime Minister Modi's still working on it. But do you blame China or do you understand China's response? Ah, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, I think that in international affairs, there are, uh, it's sometimes hard to distinguish between uh, motives of any given country. Uh, and so I, w I wouldn't hazard to say definitively that China's objections were based on its views of competition to India versus their desires to follow certain procedures. Um, and anyway, since uh, it's possible that uh, uh, this is a, a project that uh, your prime minister may still be working on and the U.S. government may still be working on, it probably is not wise for me to characterize uh, the motives of uh, one of the people who might be part of that decision. President Obama, you once said, and I'm quoting you, America can be India's best partner. Huh. On another occasion, you called Indo-US relations one of the defining partnerships of the 21st century. And to be honest, both your predecessor and your successor have spoken in almost identical terms. But there are many Indians, and I'd venture to say perhaps a majority of Indians who say that America makes a distinction between the terror groups in Pakistan, like the Haqqani Network, that target American interests in Afghanistan, and the terror groups in Pakistan, like the LET and Jesh, that primarily target India. Not just to this audience, but to the country that's listening to you beyond. How do you address this concern? Because many Indians feel that when it comes to this question of terror, the terror we face is treated differently to the terror you face. I can't speak for other administrations. I can say that that's not how we viewed it. When, when, the cri when the crisis, the tragedy in Mumbai took place, we were as obsessed with how to dismantle that network as India was. And in fact, our intelligence uh, and military personnel were immediately deployed to work with the Indian government in any ways that the Indian government determined would be helpful in getting this done. Um, so, so I actually think that there's a, there is a historic recognition, and I say that because I, I, I don't want to claim that this was unique to my administration. I think the previous administration, uh, the Bush administration, felt the same way, that uh, terrorism of any sort directed at any country has a way of metastasizing, that you can't somehow say, oh, well, that's going to be their problem now because eventually it becomes your problem later. Uh, I think what is true, and I, an understandable source of frustration, 
is the view that sometimes there are connections between explicit terrorist organizations uh, based in Pakistan and uh, elements that are connected to various uh, more official uh, entities inside of Pakistan. But that's not just true for uh, terrorist organizations that were directed at India. That's true for those that, like Akani, that killed U.S. soldiers. And that creates, a, that poses a difficulty. That's, that's been a consistent hard problem uh, for us to solve. Uh, and that is, although Pakistan has been in many ways a partner in fighting against certain terrorist organizations, what is also true is, is that there are elements that uh, sometimes have not been good partners with us. Who and are, can and I ask who these elements are? Well, uh, no. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. So, but please go ahead. Next question. I'm going to pick up on that thought of yours. In 2011, under your presidency, you had a phenomenal success in handling terror. American Navy SEALs flew undetected to Abbottabad and eliminated Osama bin Laden. Now, was Pakistan hiding Osama and therefore complicit, or was it unaware of his presence and therefore incompetent? We, uh, we had no evidence that uh, the Pakistani government was aware of bin Laden's uh, presence there. Uh, that uh, is something, obviously, that we looked at. Um, yeah. I, I will leave it to you to characterize uh, beyond uh, what I just said. Then so. what I'll point out for the audience without making it a question for you is, no. that if, is that if you had no evidence that the Pakistanis were aware of his presence, that suggests neglect or incompetence. Uh, the, uh, I think it is very important for you to stop trying to get me in trouble, for you to stop trying to get me in trouble on stage <laughs> with your words. So for those of you who are watching at home, I think Karen made uh, a point based on his opinion. <laughs> and it's, it's, it'll be useful not to tag that with, uh, I, hopefully the Hindustan Times will not run a story of what uh, Obama said there. I, I Accuracy put, in journalism. I put that very question that I put to you to President Musharraf when he came to the summit three or four years ago. Mm. And I asked him whether Pakistan was complicit or whether it was incompetent. And his answer was, and he happily, readily said this, Pakistan and the ISI were neglectful. And when I said, does neglect mean incompetence, he said, no, neglect means they fell asleep. And then he added, but the ISI has a right to fall asleep occasionally. Ah, well, that was, that's an interesting answer. A lot, President Obama, has been written and said about your relationship, your friendship with Narendra Modi. At his invitation, you came as chief guest. You were the first American president to come as chief guest on Republic Day. You did a joint radio broadcast together. And frequently, Prime Minister Modi used to refer to you as my friend Barack. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of Narendra Modi? I like him. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think that he is... Um... No, no, I, I think, I, 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 you know, I, I think that he uh, has a vision for the country that, uh, uh, you know, he is implementing and is uh, in many ways modernizing certain elements of the bureaucracy that I think are very important. But I really also was great friends with Dr. Singh. And, you know, when you look at the work and the steps that Dr. Singh took to open up and modernize the economy and launch what I think has, uh, was really the foundations for uh, the modern Indian economy, that's also important. So, uh, so I, I think, look, here, here's the bottom line. Uh, because India is a democracy, 
uh, it has politics, and, and that's a healthy thing. Uh, as a non-Indian, and as U.S. President, my job was to work with whichever party was in power. Uh, and so, uh, to avoid you getting me into trouble again, <laughs> uh, what, what I want to be very clear about is that uh, what I found with both leaders who were Prime Minister during my time, the unifying theme was that strong U.S.-India relations were important, that uh, India's movement towards a more modern economy that would give opportunity and lift m millions and tens and hundreds of millions of people out of poverty was important, that electrifying the countryside was important, that rebuilding infrastructure was important. And each uh, leader obviously had a, a, a certain view of how that was going to be accomplished. My job was not to evaluate the details of their various platforms. My job was to see whether their general focus and trajectory was consistent with uh, what I thought was uh, sound governance. And, uh, and I found both of them to be engaged honest, direct with me, and both of them took tough decisions in order to help underwrite the international system. Keep in mind, Dr. Singh was the primary interlocutor with me when we were saving the country from a global uh, financial meltdown. <laughs> Prime Minister Modi was the primary partner uh, in unlocking the Paris Accords. Neither of those things were easy, and both required some political courage back he uh, here in, uh, in India. Uh, and so uh, you will not uh, get me uh, to uh, play those games. And Obama, politicians have taken to tweeting their thoughts on any subject, I on any day, almost at any time. Do you think tweeting your message <laughs> is a sensible way of dealing directly with the people or is it dangerous? Because when you have to compress, you end up simplifying, sometimes distorting. Yeah, well, this goes to the point I was making about technology. Um, and it's fascinating. I, I have, I have an excellent focus group in my daughters, right? Because they are the generation that is on their phones. And um, you know, whenever there's some new thing or app, they have to explain it to me, and they're doing it very quickly. And I, I slow down. Wait, how do I attach this to that? And ah, you know, and then they start swiping, and um, and and so I'm, I'm able to watch and keep up with how it's being used and and how it's being absorbed. Um, and and what I would say is is that uh, Twitter, you know, Facebook, you know. WhatsApp, all, all, all these various platforms are extraordinarily powerful tools. And those tools can be used for good, and they can be used for ill. I do think it is useful to understand, and we're just beginning to understand, what some of the inherent or built-in uh, challenges exist within these new technologies. And you identified one of them, which is, is that uh, it leads to a lot of snap judgments. And psychologists uh, know that it turns out that most of uh, what are called you know, you know, quick snap judgments about complex issues are typically wrong. And so one of the dangers is, is that uh, instead of deep analysis or at least some skepticism towards initial information and then the desire to learn more, evaluate, that we, we start seeing a generation or a citizenry generally that just looks at surface and uh, the sizzle and not the steak. The sizzle and not the steak, so to speak. Um, I think I mentioned another tendency that we see is the degree to which these new technologies can create these information silos. Um, 
you know, in the United States right now, it, and this is not unique to Twitter, but it's, it's part of a trend, you know, those who watch Fox News and those who read the New York Times occupy completely different realities. I mean, if, if I watched Fox News, I wouldn't vote for me <laughs> because there's this unrecognizable character. I remember when I was president, every once in a while I'd, I'd watch and I'd, who is that guy? <laughs> you know, and, oh, this, this character named Barack Obama. And he's just portrayed in these weird ways. And there are these selective clips that come out, you know, that, where the sentence isn't finished. And then um, and it, it's all edited and shaped to promote a certain story. And obviously, those who subscribe to that view would argue that the New York Times is, is doing the same thing in its own way. But the point, though, is, is that you get these multiple realities. And it's very hard, then, for democracy to work in those situations. I, I can sit down with someone and have an argument about, about climate change. And in fact, when we were working on the Paris Accords, and some, there were some uh, folks within the Indian government who would say to me, look, uh, we're a poor country. Our priority has to be uh, getting power and electricity to poor people. And so we should not have to do X, Y, Z. And I said, well, I understand that. So we can have a debate and a dialogue around this. It's hard to have a conversation if somebody says, well, uh, climate change is a hoax. So I, I can't, I, I don't know what to do with that. I can even have a conversation with somebody who says, yes, climate change is happening, but there's nothing we can do about it, and we should just adapt. We should just go up into the hills, or we should just you know, build uh, houses on stilts, or whatever uh, arguments they may, might make about adaptation. But, but if you're saying it's a hoax, then there's no way for us to bridge our differences uh, in, a, in a constructive way. So I, I say all that to, to suggest that those of us who are leaders in any field, and look, I, I've got 100 million Twitter followers. I mean, I actually have more than other people who use it more often. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but I, I, I think it is important to, to, to be mindful about both the power of these tools, but also the, its limits. Uh, and to understand uh, that uh, it can be used for good or for ill. On this very subject, speaking in Toronto on Tuesday, your wife Michelle said, and I'm uh -oh, quoting her. what did her, she say? She said, <laughs> she said, never tweet the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> Never tweet from bed, always edit and spell check. Who do you think she had in mind? Well, it wasn't me because I do uh, spell check. And, and I also use punctuation in my, in my texts, which, which my daughters think is odd. They were explaining to us, how, oh, no, if you put a, like, a period at the end of a sentence, it sounds harsh. I said, no, that's English. You're supposed to, that's how you know the thought is finished. It's completed. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think she was just giving general advice. The same advice that you used to hear from your mother generally, right? Don't say the first thing that pops into your head. Just, I, just have a little bit of a edit function. Um, that's, that, that's wise for life. Uh, generally. I, and, and you see in, in people getting into all kinds of trouble because they just send out some tweet and then they're trying to erase it afterwards. <laughs> but somebody screenshot it and then they're embarrassed. Hey, you know, your mother and your father knew better. Listen to them. Don't do things like that. Think, I won't think before you speak. Think before you tweet. Same I, principle. I won't say amen to that. I'll say coffee instead. Ah. President Obama, my last question, because we're horribly out of time. America is famous for two Donalds, Donald Duck and Donald Trump. <laughs> Which one represents the real America? Well, uh, let, let, let me say this. Uh, the, 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 
the thing I love about America, and I suspect the thing you love about India, is uh, it is just this cacophony of life. And it throws up all kinds of variety. Uh, and there are, there are political trends in America that I don't agree with and abide by, but I recognize as a part of a running thread in American life. Uh, and one of the joys that I take about America, but also one of the frustrations is, is that it can be contradictory. And you know, we can be very kind and uh, noble. And there are times where we're cruel and short-sighted. Uh, and in that way, we're like people. Uh, and I think India is the same way. Um, but what, what I take uh, heart from is the fact that the trend lines of America, similar to the trend lines of the world, uh, are for more kindness, more inclusion, more uh, health, more education, more equality. I, I always say to young people, I used to speak to uh, young people who had come to the White House or uh, when I was traveling, uh, and, and I would say to them, look, as, as bad as the news is every day, because that's what you're seeing, understand that if you had to choose a moment in human history in which to be born, and you didn't know ahead of time what your status was going to be. You didn't know whether you were going to be a man or a woman. You didn't know whether you were going to be rich or poor. You didn't know your caste or religion. So you're just the generic human, and you had to choose a time where you had the best chance to have a good life. It would be this moment right now, as bad as sometimes things are. Now, I, I say that not, again, to, to encourage complacency, but it is to remind ourselves that we, we make progress, um, and, but we make progress only because people of goodwill are willing to work together and struggle and learn from mistakes and pass on wisdom, and we have uh, developed institutions like a free press that allow us to evaluate and critically uh, examine uh, the things that we're doing, and we've developed things like science that allows us to test our propositions and not just base what we're doing on superstitions. And, and, and all those things uh, we shouldn't take for granted. And all those things we have to pass on to our young people and our children. Uh, and uh, all those things are, 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 are values that we have to speak out on behalf of every single day. Uh, and I hope that uh, uh, in my uh, small way uh, going forward, uh, I will continue to do so. All right? Thank you very much, everybody.